This panel, I think, is going to be incredibly helpful to all of us. This is a, a panel of folks from the criminal justice system who are here to try to explain a little bit about their role and also to help you understand what it is they need from you in order to make the system work the way we would like it to work. So we're going to do this in kind of a, the flow of how things happen on the ground. So we're going to start with um, Captain Randy Pichon, and then we're going to go to uh, Chris Carlson from the Sacramento DA's office, and then to Jean Wilkinson, who is uh, from the Public Defender's office, then to Judge Manley, and then uh, to the Probation Department, which is uh, Mac Jenkins. So let me introduce the panel to you. I'm going to introduce them all now so we can just kind of move through how the, the system works. Um, Captain Randy Pushon is from uh, the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department. He has 37 years in law enforcement, including assignments in patrol, detectives, custody, court services, transportation, and search and rescue. Did you miss anything in that? No. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. Um, he's on the board of the Statewide Community Corrections um, Executive Steering Committee. He does uh, residential substance use abuse treatment in jails. He's part of the Judicial Council's Collaborative Justice Courts Advisory Committee member. Um, and he's been a facilitator for 10 years in post. That is Captain Randy Pichon. And then um, I particularly have to thank our next speaker, um, Chris Carlson from the Sacramento DA's office. He just found out he's going to be on this panel yesterday. I suddenly, I'm looking at this panel and I realized we didn't have anyone from the district attorney's office, which is a real, really critical piece of the team. And fortunately, I have a son-in-law who's an assistant DA in El Dorado County, and he put me in contact with Chris, who agreed at the very last minute to come. Uh, Chris Carlson has 22 years in the Sacramento County uh, district attorney's office. He is the, um, he's really the coordinator for AB 109 in Sacramento County. He does uh, the alternative sentencing prosecution. He uh, works with the mental health court. He worked on and helped to develop the reentry court, which just started this last July. And then uh, he's now working on a veterans court, which they hope to get up and running by this coming July. And he also uh, works with parole and post-release community supervision. He. Uh, got his law degree in UC, at UC Davis. And then our presenter will be uh, Jean Wilkinson, who's an attorney with the Orange County Public Defender's Office since 1983. As a manager in that office, she supported the many treatment collaborative courts and has been instrumental in helping to develop the, and you're gonna have to tell me, the WIT court? Whatever it takes court, which is a Prop 63 funded mental health court. <laughs> Whatever it takes court, I like that. Um, and the RC? Recovery court. Recovery court. Veterans and homeless courts. Uh, she was the first public defend defender attorney to represent the clients participating in homeless courts. She, al she also spearheaded the department's response to the AB 109 realignment, organizing training and legal and client reentry service response to this new paradigm. And then we're going to hear from Judge Stephen Manley. And if you haven't heard about Steve, uh, Judge Manley yet, you absolutely should. Because he um, is he's at the, he's on the Superior Court in Santa Clara County, where he's served over 30 years. He presently serves as the supervising judge of all felony and misdemeanor court and mental health cases in the criminal division of the court. He developed and personally presides over a number of treatment court programs and calendars that include more than 2,300 offenders who participate in treatment and rehabilitation services while on probation, supervision, or parole, who are mentally ill, mentally challenged, and substance abusers. He established one of the first mental health courts in the nation in 1998, and one of the first veterans treatment courts in 2012. The mental health court that he oversees is the largest in the nation. So again, I just, if you haven't heard about Judge Manley, you need to, because he really is um, a pioneer and a great advocate for these specialty courts. And then finally, we're gonna hear from Mac Jenkins, who represents probation. He is the uh, chief probation officer in San Diego County. 
He's worked in the criminal justice system for more than 30 years. He's currently the chief probation officer in San Diego County and oversees the department of more than 1,300 staff who provide supervision and services to more than 14,000 adult and 3,000 juvenile offenders. During his career, he's developed expertise in the delivery of evidence-based practices for community supervision and has developed, implemented, and implemented special supervision courts for drug, domestic violence, sex offenders, and mentally ill offenders. Very impressive. He's the current chair of the San Diego County Community Corrections Partnership, which is responsible for overseeing the California Community Corrections Performance in Cinevax of 2009, which was SB 678, as well as the Public Safety Realignment Act of 2011, AB 109. He's the current Vice President of the American Probation and Parole Association and the immediate past president of the Chief Probation Officers of, Calif of California. So we have an incredibly distinguished panel here to speak with you. So would you join me in welcoming them? And we will ask Captain Pichon to come up to the podium. Thank you. Good morning. About 10 years ago, um, I managed to promote, promote to the management level. I met with the sheriff and he said, well, congratulations. Uh, I'm gonna put you in charge of the Lake Tahoe jail, which I'd done my whole career in Lake Tahoe. That was great, I get to stay home. And he said, you know, I got some problems. I want you to take care of them. And I said, well, sheriff, I've never worked in the jail. I know nothing about the jail. And he goes, yeah, I don't either, good luck. So. <laughs> Um, my first or second day, I was walking through the holding area, and there was a, a, an inmate. I recognized him. I'd been arresting him for years, and he's just working industriously away in this holding cell. Um, and I said, well, what's he doing? And they said, well, he's repairing the elevator. I said, okay, well, I don't see any tools. And they said, yeah, we don't have an elevator either, but he's working away. And I said, oh, okay, and went on my way. About 10 days later, I see him in there again. I go, what's going on? They said, well, we released him. But I said, he's back. They said, well, yeah, he comes back every 10 days. And I said, well, why? And they looked at me like I was really stupid. And I, they said, well, his meds wear off. I said, well, how come we don't give him meds? And they said, well, yeah, we give him meds in jail, but then we give him a prescription when he gets out. And I said, all right, why are the meds wear out? Well, he doesn't go to the pharmacy to get the prescription filled. I said, where's the pharmacy? There's one across the street. And they said, well, it's a county contract pharmacy. Okay, great, where is it? Well, it's in Placerville. 65 miles away, over the mountains. This was in February that year, and back then we had snow. Um, and I said, well, okay, so he's not mentally ill then. And they said, what do you mean, boss? You're kind of stupid, boss, but what do you mean? I said, well, if he can get from Tahoe to Placerville in February in the snow and back without public transportation, because I know he doesn't drive, he can't be mentally ill. And they gave me this very puzzled look and went, yeah, whatever, and walked away. Well, that was my start through dealing with the mentally ill in jail. Um, fast forward 10 years. We now have this realigned population that everybody's worried about. We have still huge issues with mental illness in jails. But we've taken a different path. So in our county, and every county is different, but I know a lot of these, we stole all of these programs, by the way, so I know they're out there. Um, we start before people get arrested. Uh, we created a multidisciplinary team in the county. It's law enforcement. It's all the social services, mental health. And they meet every couple of weeks of how to keep people out of the criminal justice system. As part of that, we created a crisis intervention team in our patrol division. And, and sheriff's offices are a dual personality organization. One side of the house works really hard to put people in jail. And the other side of the house is supposed to do something magic to keep them from coming back. And it's like the two sides of the house just kind of collide. So we have 20 deputies. We're not a very big department, but we have 20 deputies. And their job, in addition to their duties, is to go out and make contact with their mentally ill clients, We're partnered with mental health, and check in on them on a regular basis. Are you taking your meds? Do you, are you picking up your SSI check? How's it going? And that way, when the mental health clinician calls up and says, the person's fallen off the radar, Boom, that day they're out there, hey, can I give you a ride into mental health? You're not under arrest, we're not, not in trouble, no handcuffs, come on, let's go. Um, and that's working extremely well for us. Um, so, people still come to jail. They come into jail, 
and even before they get there, we have a caregiver outreach program. If you go on our website, we have a forum. We've partnered with uh, NAMI, National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. If you know of a caregiver, give them this form, have them fill it out. When a person goes to jail, get us the form back. It lists their doctor, it lists their diagnosis, their meds, their history. You can fax it in. A lot of times, mentally ill person's coming in the back door, the caregiver's there at the front door, and they've got the form filled out, and they've got the bag of meds. Thank you very much. If it's medically possible, we'll start treatment right now. Um, we do the standard care in the jail for people. Uh, about, and all that was, was working pretty well, but people kept coming back. It wasn't working. So one of my good friends at NAMI said, why don't you create a mental health court? And oh, okay, what's that? <laughs> and they said, well, Nevada County has them. Anybody from Nevada County? Nevada County has an excellent mental health court program. So we said, let's do that. So we called them up and said, hey, Nevada County, do you have any written guidelines or anything? Oh, yeah, we got protocols. Can you send them to me? Yeah. So we shamelessly took the word Nevada County out of it and put in El Dorado County. <laughs> I'm just a cop, OK? Um, and I said, well, how do I do this? So I went, well, wait a minute. My neighbor is Judge Kingsbury, who is the presiding judge of El Dorado County. Hey, neighbor, how do we do this? She goes, I'd love to do that. And we couldn't get anybody to come to a meeting. Nobody wanted to play. And so I said, judge? And she goes, bring food. <laughs> well, anyway, I got a kitchen. And we had just started a culinary arts program partnered with a community college. So we invited people to the meeting, and we brought those big, huge, gooey, dripping cinnamon rolls. And all of a sudden, people wanted to play. So we said, this is what we wanted to do. Well, they had just taken a big bite of the cinnamon rolls, and I guess I forgot to bring milk because they couldn't swallow, and they couldn't say no. So we started at Mental Health Court. And after a couple of meetings, people started complaining about gaining weight. So we went back to our culinary people, and we spun off jailhouse catering. It's so good, it's a crime. Um, and we started <laughs> catering lunch meetings for the court team. And suddenly, we had every attorney in town wanting their client in the mental health court. Well, a counselor, your client's here on a drunk driving. Yeah, but I can come to lunch if you know, I get, no, no, you, sorry, mental illness only. So this took off on us. We had established a success goal of 10 inmates out of the jail for a year without returning. We emptied one third of our beds in the county the first year. Didn't come back. Partnered closely with mental health and probation, close supervision, used pre-existing programs, structured the sentences, and I'm sure Judge Manley will talk more about this, structured the sentences for good supervision in the community, and they didn't come back to jail. Uh, just huge. So a jail's not a hospital. We're not a mental health facility. We're not like Cook County. Uh, you could take both of our jails and put them comfortably into the pod they were talking about in the video. But they stopped coming back to jail for the most part. Um, so what are we doing today? Realignment hit us, and we started getting more inmates in. And all of a sudden, the sheriff comes to me and says, by the way, you've had a good time in Tahoe. Come on down to Plasville. You're now my jail captain. Great, <laughs> thanks. And he said, and write a plan. Get with somebody and write a plan. Well, everybody's looking at each other going, what do we do with realignment? And there were these visions in the community of busloads of inmates showing up from prison. No, doesn't work that way. Um, so what are we going to do? Well. Three of us sat down and said, well, we did this mental health court plan. Let's just do the same thing for all the inmates. And that's what we did. So they go through the standard programming. We brought more programs into the jail using the uh, realignment funds. We ran out of programming space. So we said, well, wait a minute. We have 24 inmates per pod. Let's take all the inmates and put them all in the same programs and put them in a pod. And then the day room becomes the classroom. Well, no, you can't you know, staff. No, no, you can't do that. Why not? Well, we don't do it that way. Well, if you've always done it that way, it's probably wrong, so let's try it. It's working. And it's even really cool because we outfit the day room as the programming pot, you know, with smart boards and all this really cool stuff. And if the inmate doesn't want to go to class that day, we turn off the TV. So the inmates now tell each other, we have to go to class because Days of Our Lives is on later, so we've got to watch TV. This has freed up space and time for the intensive programming for the mentally ill. It seems like a really simple concept, 
selling it was a little difficult. So then we said, wait a minute, they're getting out of jail. What do we do to make sure they don't come back when they get out of jail? Because they go from the full structured environment to no structure whatsoever, like that. We said, well, wait a minute, let's go talk to Health and Human Services. And they went, well, yeah, we have the Public Guardian's Office. What do they do? And throughout this process, I realized that we always know what everybody else does, and we're just convinced of it. And then you sit down and ask them, and you find out you really don't know what they do. Well, they have transition case managers. Mm, what's that? Well, they kind of set up appointments and get them into their services and make sure they have housing. And Oh, cool. Can I have two? You bet. We'll give you two. So now we start the transition process 60 days before they get out of jail. They have their appointments at mental health. They, have, they meet with their probation officer. All this is set up before they leave. And it's keeping people from coming back. Because in our minds with realignment, the sheriff even said it, if we deal with the 18% in our jail that are mentally ill, we're not going to have to build another jail for a long time. We will have enough room for the realigned inmates. It's working so far. Two years into it, it's working so far. Um, our next step is going to, well, we had to bring in an analyst because we go, we don't know why this is working. We need hard data. So don't ask me for hard data. We're still working on that. Um, but our next step is to follow Alameda County's lead because we steal everybody's good ideas. And we're going to change up our computer system so every single person being booked into our jails is enrolled into the Affordable Care Act. And then we'll have eligibility workers to be completing that process. The biggest takeaway, if you can get anything out of this, is all of us throughout the system, everybody up here and all of you, have the same clients. It's the same 10% of the population. There's no point in duplicating efforts if you can avoid it. So that's my big takeaway for you today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, or pretty soon it'll be afternoon. Um, my preparation for today is kind of like how I got introduced to all this AB 109 stuff. Um, I was a happy prosecutor, prosecuting people, sending them away, not really thinking anything about that. <clears throat> and then realignment came along, and I'm kind of like our legal scholar type guy, and they're like, oh, there's 1,600 pages of new law, Chris, go learn it. So I dove into it and I learned it. And I like all that legal stuff. And then like um, my uh, DA Jan Scully was pretty uh, forward thinking and decided that we would create an alternative sentencing position in our office. So my duty basically was to deal with all aspects of AB 109. And I went from joking and laughing about evidence-based practices to actually having to read about it and learn about it. And then, oh, okay, Chris, you're going to be uh, in charge of our mental health court, and why don't you oversee drug court a little bit, and why don't you start a, a reentry court, and you're going to start a uh, veterans court. And so I actually had to start go out, start meeting people involved with mental health, involved with AOD, involved with the health system, and it really was a crash course in um, what you guys deal with every day. And again, it's a thing that a lot of DAs don't necessarily think about. Um, but realignment and the whole idea of let's try and get these people out of the criminal justice system is really taking hold with DAs now uh, all across the state. And the big, I think one of the best things about realignment is it has really forced everybody to start to work together because we all have resource problems and we all have to work together to make the best use of the resources that we have. Now our mental health court uh, started, I believe it was 2006, it started with a nice Mallorca grant and everything was great, but like all good things, grants come to an end, right? And the real estate bubble hit, um, Probation was taken out of our mental health court, and it was basically left um, 
the DA's office, the courts, the public defender's office, just supplying their people to keep it going, and it limped on, and the only people that they would really accept were people that were already connected with the mental health system. Uh, because they had county providers who had the personal service coordinators, we call them PSCs, who would help oversee these people, and they in fact were basically our probation officers because they were keeping an eye on these people. And it was really essential. Um, fast forward to um, recently, and our county mental health actually has given us a full-time person who is part of our multidisciplinary team now that helps hook people up that are in jail charged with crimes or out of custody charged with crimes that don't have mental health services and has now uh, hooked them up to so that we can get them into our mental health court. And she's been so successful that we've went from approximately 40 to 50 people less than a year ago to at the last end of the last month, we had almost 90 people in our court and we're full. And now we're looking at trying to get just a misdemeanor mental health court going, a domestic violence mental health court going. And as a result, <clears throat> another thing that has changed is the DAs in my office have seen how successful the mental health court has, and they're much more comfortable about a lot, you know, recommending and referring cases to come in there. And that's another reason that it's grown. In the reentry court, our focus was on people that otherwise would be going to county jail prison. And rather than sending them to county jail prison, we would suspend that time, put them on probation, and then they would go through a treatment program at uh, our probation department's adult day reporting center, ADRCs. And we rather naively started out and we would have these people come in. They'd agree to all the conditions for our court. They would be sentenced. We would release them. And then we wouldn't see them. The addresses that they gave to probation, of course, they weren't there. And uh, they, of course, when we arrested them, they were high or they got arrested again. And so we got much more intelligent about it and weren't letting these people out of custody until they could give a verifiable address. And those that were homeless, uh, we uh, worked out a deal with our VOA who had a 90-day program for people that were on probation and or people that were on the Sheriff's Home Detention Project and got those people in there. And our success rate uh, increased greatly. Uh, and one of the issues, main issues that we're seeing with a lot of this population is the ho housing issues. They don't have safe places to live. They have um, burned all their bridges. And that's a problem. They don't have a safe place to live. The only people that they can live with are people that are doing drugs, and that increases the problems. And some of the people with the um, drug problems, both in mental health court and in reentry court, we want to get these people into a uh, residential rehab programs. And again, there's problems there because in our county, you go out of custody to an AOD assessment and then out of custody to an orientation later. And a lot of these people, we don't want them out of custody. We would rather have them go straight from a custody situation into a residential treatment program. And that's not something that's available. So that's something that definitely would be nice it was to work out something to do uh, in custody so that those assessments could be done there and there can be that transition. Thank you.
Good morning. I need to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm in my first week of retirement, so I'm no longer the chief deputy for the County of Orange of Public Defender's Office. However, I still come to you with the same passion and perhaps a little bit of reflection on realignment and what it means to the criminal justice system. I know you've all worked with public defenders a lot in the collaborative treatment courts, probably also the Prop 36 treatment court, and have a familiarity with what we do in, in that capacity. Um, but realignment really changed the paradigm. Realignment brought into this criminal justice system a large number of clients that we were not previously representing. And, and just some quick realignment um, analysis, be before realignment there were essentially two sentencing options for individuals charged with felons. Probation and jail or no jail or state prison. Realignment created a, a richer paradigm of options for the court and that's where you hear that term, mandatory supervision. That is, certain individuals with non-violent, non-serious, non-sex registrant, non-super big fraud cases, no longer go to state prison if the judge wants to give them the equivalent of a state prison sentence, they can be sentenced to county jail. And that sentence can have one, or two, one of two paradigms. They do the entire term in jail, and that's county jail, state prison, terminal, or the judge can split that sentence, and if the judge splits that sentence so that some of that time is done in jail, some of that time is done out of jail on supervision, that supervision is mandatory supervision. What's really new for us in the courts, the district attorney's office, the public defender's office, is we essentially picked up three categories of cases that we had not previously represented. People who violate on that mandatory supervision, because previously they would have been in state prison, they would have been released on parole, we did not represent people on parole violations people on parole we now represent in the court system. And the individuals who were nonviolent but had previously been sent to state prison prior to realignment and are getting out on post-release community supervision. So now we're faced with a richer, deeper, bigger class of clients that we have our continuing ethical obligations to represent in a meaningful way. The California Constitution right to counsel requires competent counsel, and competent counsel has always included investigating, researching, and promoting alternative sentences as part of our obligation to represent. That's why we always jump in with both feet when you want to start a new collaborative court, because that is part of our ethical obligation to look for every alternative that can meet our client's needs. Realignment is essentially collaborative courts on steroids. 17.5 of the Penal Code, if you want to just learn one really important piece of that legislation, codifies a lot of the wisdom that we gain from working in the collaborative courts. So those things that we learned are effective in treating our clients and really intervening in their lives, like rapid intervention, short-term incarceration, structured treatment, right, productive use of their daytime, training them to lead the lives that we need them to lead because they didn't have those skills or those supports in their neighborhood and their community, those are codified in the penal code now under 17.5. You can't imagine how excited I was when I started reading, as the DA did, that incredible lengthy piece of legislation. And literally, AB 109 itself was 489 pages. I know it because I went through each one carefully trying to figure out what it meant because it came at us so quickly. But that statute really captures for you the opportunity and the responsibility that realignment brings to us. People, not you, because I know you're here as people who care about these individuals, often minimize realignment by saying, oh, it's just the governor's way to deal with that injunction, the pesky things that are going on, the cost of state prisons, he needs to crawl out from underneath the federal courts that are writing him hard. But I need you to remember that those cases, Playa and Coleman, came from a tragic reality of what was happening in our state prisons and what the overcrowding meant to our clients and our people who are mentally ill. If you just Google Coleman, Playa, U.S. Supreme Court, Governor Brown, you can come up with that decision. And if you look at the exhibits that support that ruling, 
your heart will break. There's one picture in particular that shows an individual who's suicidal and where that person is placed when they're suicidal is an obscenity. They're placed in a wired cage with a padlock in one of our state prisons. That's, in this millennium, how somebody with that kind of a tragic mental illness was being treated. That's where the outrage and the concern and the need to reform the criminal justice system came from. But it also came from the wisdom that we all learned collaborating in the collaborative courts about what works and how we really can transform lives. Now, I feel particularly lucky to have worked in Orange County, where we have a very robust collaborative court system, where we have a number of mental health treatment courts, a veterans court, drug court, driving under the influence court. And because of the, the many years that we worked in creating those courts, we have a very strong, healthy, trusting, respectful relationship. In addition, our, our healthcare agency, under the direction of Mark Rafowitz, was always inclusive, making sure that our office and the DA's office and the courts were invited and present when Mental Health Services Act passed and the steering committee was created, that we always had an opportunity to be present and learn and be heard about the needs of our clients. And I can't say how much I appreciate that and how critical that was to us being prepared for realignment when it came, to really understanding what services are available. I encourage you, if you don't have that kind of a relationship with your local public defender's office, to try and identify who it might be you could create that kind of relationship with. We um, are also fortunate to have a very enlightened sheriff who has had a reentry services team in her court, in her jails, and that team works with our lawyers all the time, communicating with them, troubleshooting case plans for re release plans, inviting my staff into the jail to teach group uh, classes on things like, you know, how to expunge your records so that the individuals have something to look forward to, a goal to reach, that there actually is a light at the end of the tunnel if they successfully complete their supervision. We learned from our homeless court that the most basic fundamental needs of our clients are sometimes the most critical things to getting them in a position to move forward successfully. So we partner with probation, we partner with healthcare, we partner with the jail to do something as simple as order a birth certificate. So when that client gets out of custody, they have the capacity to link to benefits and services, to get into a treatment program that requires an ID, uh, to just start them on that path so that they can actually move forward. That's so simple, but we do that because it's absolutely necessary and critical. The reflection part that I was thinking about as I was preparing to talk to you today was I think one place that I failed was in not inviting the partners to come into our office more regularly and to talk with our staff and train our staff on what programs and services are available. You know, the collaborative courts treat a finite number of people. Realignment touches thousands and thousands appearing in our courts every day. And we have an obligation to have every judge in our system understand what the alternatives are for sentencing. And you know, I'm gonna tell you, I have a little bit of a public defender paranoia. And I know that having done this for over 30 years, a lot of judges, when we come into the courtroom, say, oh, it's just you guys, you liberal, soft-hearted people. You don't really know what your clients are like or what they need. And it's a struggle every day even with the statutory construct of realignment, to get a lot of old time judges to hear us when we say, this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is evidence-based practices. You know, I have lawyers working in a felony probation violation court where they're dealing with 30 or 40 people every single day, and every time they stand up and say, but evidence-based practices, come on, we've, we've gotta look at something different for this client, and the judge is still giving the same sentence as a matter of routine that they gave 20 years ago. So what I need, and I think what we need, is your help to find ways to get into that courtroom on a daily basis, teaching judges about programs and services, why they matter, how they work. Get them to start to absorb that into their everyday practice. These are people, I think, who want to do justice, who want to do the right thing, but it takes time to absorb these programs, these services, and how we can really make a difference. What worries me and frightens me is that we have this amazing promise 
because I think realignment is what the system should be doing. But if we don't work fast enough and hard enough to make it catch, we could lose. So thank you. Good morning, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, talk about uh, uh, some, some specific areas and really address these towards uh, what my colleague Judge Loftus uh, presented in terms of the recommendations of our task force. Because uh, a lot of uh, those recommendations, believe it or not, came out of our experiences in mental health treatment courts. Whether it was in Orange County or Santa Clara County was not the issue. The, the, the things that we had tried and worked on for years and were proving successful, it seemed to us had application across the state and we've already heard about what can be done in a small county and what can be done in a large county. So to me, uh, you know, these, these promising practices in, are, are embodied in these recommendations that have been presented to you this morning. But I know that some, we sit back and we say, well, okay, there's another set of recommendations, and they, yeah, they sound wonderful, and they would all work, be a great world, but it's never going to happen. Uh, because, you know, it just will not work in this kind of county or that kind of county, because we're 58 different models of anything. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to maybe perhaps focus more on judges, and I'm, I'm only going to talk about my bench, uh, who I know well, and, and to give you some, some idea of what really can be done. I do believe that the key uh, is really not just collaboration. The key is getting judges, as has just been <laughs> stated, getting judges on board to doing things differently. And can it be done? Yes, it can. Uh, I have approximately 2,300 offenders mentally ill, substance abusers, also TBI, dementia, and, and, they're, and, and they're there, okay, fine, but how exactly do you get 2,300 offenders into any kind of a program? This takes judges, and you know, if the judges are not together, uh, things do not move forward. Now, in the beginning, a number of years ago, the judges were not together. They did not necessarily believe in anything that I'm doing in, this, uh, in our program. But they have changed, and they have dramatically changed on our bench in the last two years. Um, and so some of the things Judge Loftus was talking about, we are actually doing in a very large way for all mentally ill offenders. Now, are we doing it for every offender? No. But we are doing it for mentally ill offenders, and I find this very, very hopeful because if we can do it for the mentally ill, we can do it for all. And what is taking place is this. We have, you know, we talk about discharge planning and, and the importance of judges incorporating mental health conditions of probation in a very specific way. I teach this, to, I made presentation to our judges and other judges, you know, don't just say you enter uh, mental health treatment. Talk specifically, what program are they going to go to? Where do they go next? What about the medications? Well, what we have started um, in the last two to three years, and it is working, is what we call a pre-plea assessment for mental illness. What happens is the offenders, before they enter their plea, before they are sentenced, they are assessed, diagnosed, and the beginning of a plan is put together, a plan that starts when they're in jail, and the next step is when they're out of jail. And so that judge then who sentences, who is not me, directs the defendant as a part of their sentence to do these specific things and to be in the mental health treatment court, all right? And so what you have is the beginning of a discharge plan that has real teeth in it because they will be monitored, they will be supervised, and they will be in treatment. But this involves, of course, the close relationship 
with the jail and within our county, we call it custody mental health. Every jail has got to deal with the mentally ill. There is someone in the jail that's going to know something about them. I don't care how little it is, it's information that's going to help you. And if you are not close with them, if mental health is not tied into that uh, decision process, because decisions are made every day about the mentally ill in the jail, where they are placed. Uh, we've heard a description of the kind of conditions they can be placed in. But that decision is made by someone who has some knowledge that this person is different and is, has got real problems, and they're going to deal with them the way they're going to deal with them. But if you can tie that together, then you can start that planning in the jail, which is what we have done. We work very closely because we have a very large jail. Uh, over 4,000 um, uh, offenders are in it. We work very closely with that uh, custody, treatment element in the jail. So that when you get booked, if you are being seen and receiving medications, we know that if you are not and you need them, that communication goes back. Because when you deal with a very large group of people or a small group of people, you can still miss them. That's why one of the reasons we're seeing more and more challenges from under realignment from people coming out of prison is that the prison system does not always place them where they should be because of the lawsuits and the federal litigation. So people are in the general population, and if you know anything about the way the prisons work, if you aren't identified as mentally ill and get uh, treatment in the, in the prison, then when you're released, nobody tells the counties and the courts or mental health that, well, you got, you know, you got this guy too and he's really mentally ill. Uh, they don't tell you that. And then they show up in court and, and you know, we got to do something about it. Well, the thing to do about it is to be on top of it, which is what we have tried to do. For example, well, you know, I want to, uh, in addition to having the discharge plan and the assessment, which is really, you know, we can get really complicated about this. We can insist on a psychiatrist. We can insist on, uh, insist on a full evaluation. We do this in the court all the time. We waste more time and effort and, uh, you know, and more hours and, 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 and pe keeping people locked up forever to get the right evaluation and make the right decision. We know the person's mentally ill. We already have them in the mental health records. We just don't tie all this together. So in our court, what we do is we try to tie all of this together. So in the courtroom, in the mental health treatment court, we have the mental health assessors there. We do not wait for the jail to assess people. If we see the person, they're sent there, we assess them right away with the idea is to put that plan together and get them out of jail. Uh, we have added a urgent care clinic in the courthouse. Why? Because people decompensate when they leave uh, the jail. They stop taking their medications. They never get the prescription filled, whatever. They decompensate after they've been in community treatment for six months. Now, we don't want them to go back to jail. So what we have found is they actually will come to court, amazingly enough. Uh, and if you make the court user friendly, they will come more, they'll be more likely to come. Then you need to have the services there, which takes a tremendous amount of commitment from your mental health department. And I must say, you know, and, and I think this is something you can take away. Look, um, you can say that, you know, well, mental health and substance abuse, we're here to help everyone. And, we, and, and we're not here to single and to put all our resources in helping these uh, criminals and these offenders because they screw up all the time. They never follow through and on and on and on. But I'm going to tell you, they are the biggest problem we have at the local level. And if we don't do something about it, and if we don't give them priority, and if we don't put the money into the treatment, they're not going to be, uh, that treatment, their needs are not going to be addressed because they do not follow through. They don't do anything they're told to do. I understand that. I've been working with them for years. So what we've done is, is we have wonderful support from mental health and from the county in pouring resources into this specific population to not say, oh, well, after they get out of jail, then you direct them to come to a, you know, a clinic and we will, you know, we will provide the treatment if they show up and if they take their medications and on and on. Now, it's a different approach. And, and the reason I stress it is because the same is true with drug and alcohol. In the past, uh, you know, only 10%, 15% of their clients were, were uh, criminal justice. Now it's 90. 
And that's not just Proposition 36. It's a change in view. It's an understanding that if someone's in residential treatment because they're using drugs all the time, they need to have their medications if they're mentally ill. You know, I mean, this is, you know, to me, to this day, I cannot understand, but I see it uh, in many, many places where you can't have your medications if you're in this program because, oh, good heavens, you're taking clonopin or whatever, and ah, it's, it's addictive. I mean, in our jail, you can't have Wellbutrin because that's addictive. It's not addictive, it's used on the street. And I guess it becomes addictive if you snort it long enough. Uh, so we don't have Wellbutrin. Well, you know, we could argue about Wellbutrin forever, but that isn't the answer. The answer is to make sure that the medications that work for the person are available. And, and that's what we've been able to do. And I think when Judge Loftus talks about a common formulary and about the discharge planning, you know, well, how does that practice, you know, how does this work, all right? So let me tell you what we do. You know, when, and, and it's very simple, you've heard from the sheriff, the captain, the captain, he should be sheriff, he's doing, I mean, these things, you're doing wonderfully up there. I'm gonna make you sheriff. With Judge Kingsbury, the two of you, um, the sheriff and the, and the presiding judge, you know, exactly what he's doing, all right, that's a small county, you know, they're, they're, no, they're not that many people to, forget it, we're a huge county, we're doing the very same thing. You see, these principles work. Uh, can you get parole? I want to talk about parole and probation quickly. Uh, because parole and probation, and, and I know um, uh, Chief Jenkins is going to talk about them, and, and uh, he's doing a wonderful job in San Diego. And they'll say, well, but Mac Jenkins is, a, you know, he's, he's inspiring, he's a genius, he knows how to make things happen, but, but nobody, no, no. You know, you could do this anywhere. I will tell you what we did at our county, and, I, and I, it's just one way to do things. Created a separate unit. Uh, probation officers to work with the mentally ill, number one, okay? Smaller caseloads. Number two, get them out of the office. Put them in the, in the field. Number three, have them run events and programs in community centers where all the clients go. So instead of having to go to the probation office, which they never will do, you meet them out in the community and you do your supervision, your drug testing and everything right there. And it works. Now, what about parole? Everybody say, well, parole can never change. Not true. Uh, starting in 2008, they put together a reentry court long before reentry was there. Okay, this is long before the statute was, uh, the statutes were changed. It, the idea was to get parole involved. I mean, we have the judges sentencing, and then we have these people on probation, and then they're on parole, and parole does this, and probation does that. It seemed crazy to me. Put it all together. Can parole agents change? Amazingly, they are so receptive to change uh, if you push them, okay? You gotta push them. And you know, that's why you have judges. You know, that's the one thing judges can do. So, you know, now our parole violations, oh, well, we, we haven't had one hearing, we probably never will because they go to the reentry court or we turn the parole revocation court into a reentry court and see these people again and again in treatment. And what is the role of the parole agent? My parole agents go to the jail. They pick the person up. You know, this is sort of like a case manager, right? They drive them to the, our, our pharmacy, which we have for the county. It's not that far away. It's not in Placerville, but it's, it's a bit of a, a challenge to get there and they pick up the medications, they then take them to their program and, and they're placed there. Then the parole agents does what took about a year to learn to get this right. They drive away. They don't park at the end of the street to watch them leave so they can arrest them again and throw them back in jail. They drive away. Now you would say, well, that's, well that sounds, what's the big deal about that? Well, I'll tell you, for parole to think differently that way, to, to really be, more about, I'm gonna give somebody a chance and see how they do as opposed to, I'm gonna watch them fail and then punish them. See, it's a different mindset and it's happened. And, and to me, it's wonderful. Uh, and it can be done, it can be done. But, you know, and I don't care how it's done, but it can be done. Uh, and I, this, this took less than a year for probation. It took less than oh, six months with parole. Uh, you know, you, they're sick and tired of not having success, I guarantee you. Um, and it can be done. I want to talk also about incompetence. 
You know, I, there, if there's one thing that dr drives me up the wall, it's, it's, it's the way the courts deal with incompetence. All right, and we're, we, we deal with it the way we're told to because there's statutes that tell us what to do. But the result is, you may not know this, but you know, if it's a felon who's in, found incompetent, they can be sent to a state hospital. All right, treatment at a state hospital. Well, there's no room for them, of course, uh, there. Uh, there's a 300 or 400 waiting list. But if you're a misdemeanor, you can be just as mentally ill, just as incompetent, and you have all these findings and so forth, nowhere to send them but jail. So what happens is we warehouse these people in jail. I said, well, this is ridiculous. Why don't we talk about something that is in our recommendations? And that is community treatment. Everybody, I don't care if you go to the state hospital for four years. I mean, I see people that come back and forth and back and forth. And now, well, where do they all end up? They end up right in the community. So why don't you treat people in the community? Why don't you stop saying that everyone who's mentally ill is gonna kill somebody and therefore we gotta lock them up? So what we do, and this again, is with the full support of the judges, the district attorney, the public defender, we release them to the community and place them in community treatment and I supervise them on a separate calendar. And you know what, they do wonderfully. Our problem is, <laughs> They get restored to competence, you see, and then it's, we're in a treatment world, and now we're back to an adversarial world, and they have to go off to another court. Fortunately, things work out. It's amazing how when, uh, when people's uh, competency is restored, um, that, you know, we have a very reasonable system because everybody involved, the DA, public defender, and the judge who will see them next, knows they have gone through this incredible transformation. They are something different than they were before as perceived. Um, and, and that has been very successful. And I just suggest to you, and, and the same is true with TBI, this was brought up earlier, the mentally challenged and dementia. Yes, these are huge problems. This is not mentally ill, but let me tell you something. When you're in the streets like I am and you see people every day, my, my clients who are, have TBI, they're taking mental health medications. They are mentally ill as well. This is a co-occurring disorder so often, particularly with veterans, particularly with veterans. And we can't just say, well, we're not going to give you mental health treatment because you have TBI. We got to treat both conditions. Dementia, not a mental illness. So we are ignoring it. Just let this person sit in jail forever. No. We got to get them treatment, and it's only going to happen if we work together. The mentally disabled, I have a whole calendar of them, and let me tell you, 90% of them take mental health medications. They may be in the San Andreas system or not in any system at all, but they do, by San Andreas, I mean the regional center system, uh, and, you know, under, under disability, but they take medication. So we've got to stop this. They're not mentally ill, so it's not our problem. We gotta bring everybody together, and, and you can do it. Uh, and when you do it, there's one other thing we have to remember. And, and you, we, we started this program with two people speaking who are incredibly articulate and have, have done such wonderful things with their lives. But, but what about the people that never quite are able to make that transformation? We still have an obligation to listen to them. I, one of the things I believe in, and it's not in our recommendations, unfortunately, because it does not relate to any, you know, agency or department or judge or whatever who's going to be working with people. We need to learn to listen to clients. Listen to clients. I, I don't know anything, you know, I, well, I know a little bit, but not much about mental illness. Uh, I don't, please, be very careful about ever letting judges, I worry about them having this little book. It's very nice to learn all these terms. But judges like to be doctors. They like to be everything, you know? They know everything, right? They're in charge. And, and, they, and you know what the idea, you know how you treat mentally ill people? Put them in residential treatment for eight years. You know what I mean? Whatever is the closest to being, well, what you do with other people, because these people may be dangerous. So what I believe in is, is that we, we should never allow judges to do that. These decisions have to be made by treatment. Judges have to believe in treatment and trust them. Trust treatment, always trust treatment, because treatment is gonna get it right. You know, we're not, never gonna get it right, judges. So, well, no, when we get into this area, we're lost. Uh, but we have to learn to listen to people who are before us. And all of us need to do that. 
because I find the greatest input in the world comes from clients. You know, I hear people say to me, I heard it yesterday. Well, Judge, I have now, he's changed, changed my medication. Now I have Zoloft and I don't have Ativan. And now I, I feel horrible. I'm having withdrawal symptoms. You know, that's basically what they're telling me. And I said, well, did you tell the doctor this? Have you gone? I mean, the doctor's right down the hall. What, what are we doing here? You see, well, well, no, I wouldn't, I can't do that. He'll get mad at me. No, he's not going to get mad at you. He's there to help you. See, we need, we need to listen more to clients because they really do make this system work. Uh, and it's not going to work without them because, because and particularly judges have to listen to them because their excuses that we often say are ridiculous are real. You know, the fact, when someone dies in their family, it is very important just as it would be to any of us and they don't come to court, or they don't see the doctor. And then they have all these other problems, and the transportation in my county, if you don't have a car, you're dead, because it's an hour and a half to get to court. Uh, I mean, we're not even rural, I mean, for heaven's sakes, but I mean, you can't get anywhere in traffic. So we have to learn to listen to people a lot more than we ever have in the past. Well, that's it, thank you. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Manley, for that uh, Mac Jenkins endorsement. I certainly appreciate that. Um, I am a probation officer, probation chief, and um, it's not by accident that I um, am the last speaker uh, from this panel to talk because really um, that order was selected because it largely reflects the course of our criminal justice system, if you will. We heard a law enforcement official from the Sheriff's Department speak first, who handed it to a district attorney, who handed it to a public defender, and then the court, uh, the Honorable Judge Manley, of course, they could speak wherever they want to speak <laughs> in terms of the judges, and then um, to probation, because our role in the criminal justice system is largely to work with the individuals as they, as they have traversed through that continuum and to try and implement the court's orders and also to try and work with those individuals to achieve a positive outcome. So what I'm gonna do here in, in the time that I have, and I'm going to try and do it in about 10 minutes, is talk about um, the impact of realignment, talk about very specifically the community corrections, and in this case, a probation role in the context of realignment, but also in the context of working with individuals who have substance abuse problems and who also suffer from mental illness. Now I know all of you, or I understand all of you, some of you are mental health professionals, some of you are substance abuse professionals. I don't know off the top of my head you know, how familiar you are actually with probation. Uh, I suspect if you're at all like the general public, you don't know what we do. The general public frequently confuses probation and parole and uses those terms interchangeably. They're very different things. Um, but part of my objective this morning is for you as mental health professionals and as substance abuse professionals to have a more clear understanding of what you should not only expect from us but require from us so that you see better outcomes with the folks that you work with um, in your roles. I really, really was impressed by, um, I think it was Dennis Cook, if I'm saying your name right, when he described that scenario of one client who, um, I think he described that she said, you know, I have to be, I have to meet with my probation officer at nine o'clock or he's gonna revoke me. I have to meet with my, I think, child care worker or I'm gonna lose my kids. I have to meet with, she talked about five different entities that she had to meet with uh, and if she didn't do that, there was gonna be a negative outcome. That's a reality of people that we work with. That is a true reality. It never has to happen. It never has to happen. I appreciate what Jean said when she talked about public safety realignment being um, collaborative courts or drug courts on steroids because I absolutely have found that to be true. Those of us that have worked in drug courts and collaborative courts did not panic when we saw necessarily public safety realignment and what it was pushing us towards because we've had the experience in collaborative courts and drug courts. My experience in those programs goes back to 1995. And I'm gonna share some real specifics just before I close about you know, why I'm such a believer in this. You heard in the background 
that I chair the Community Corrections Partnership. Every probation chief chairs the Community Correction Partnership. And those partnerships are charged with overseeing 678, which preceded AB 109, which is public safety realignment. The import of that is that in the Community Corrections Partnership, these are, the, these are the executive committee members of the Community Corrections Partnership. The probation chief as a chair, the court has a seat, the district attorney's office has a seat, the public defender's office, the fence bar has a seat, someone representing behavioral health has a seat, and also there are other frontline law enforcement also has a seat. Look at those entities. Those are all of the entities that work together in collaborative courts and drug courts. So it wasn't an accident that they were tasked with very specific responsibilities in AB 109 and what has become public safety realignment. Now, again, my point now is to talk about the community corrections role. And I already asked you uh, in, in terms of, or at least threw out a rhetorical question about what your familiarity was with um, probation. I will suspect that many of you, depending upon your experience with probation officers or parole officers, have seen that role as primarily a surveillance function or a trail -em, with a trail -em, nail -em, jail -em role. And I'm here to tell you that if we're going to achieve the, the opportunities that something like public safety realignment presents to us, if, and not the challenges, if we're going to really improve the outcomes and lives of the individuals that fall into that scenario that Mr. Cook told us about earlier, probation or community corrections has to change that role. I will also tell you that the role in its, in, in its inception was not just a trail em, nail em, jail em role. Those of you that are histories of the criminal justice system and probation specifics know that the probation role started as a therapeutic, balanced approach. The very first probation officer, John Augustus, worked with an alcoholic from a court in Boston, Massachusetts, and literally what he told the judge was, Your Honor, you don't have to lock up these alcoholics. Instead, entrust them to my care. I will work with them, help them try and become sober, help them try and get a job, and I will report back to you periodically so you don't have to lock them up. What happens now in 2014, this, this criminal justice system, certainly in California, can seize the opportunity to return to the core purposes of what probation was all about. So that's what I'm certainly trying to push in San Diego, and the Probation Chiefs Association is also cognizant of the opportunity that's, that's in front of us. So I want, you, I want to disabuse you of the notion that probation's only role is to trail them, nail them, jail them. Because what I talk about in my department, what we're trying to train my officers to do, the standard that we're going to hold them to is being focused on behavior change. Behavior change for even those who are mentally ill, certainly those that suffer from substance abuse addiction. So what we talk about now is recognizing that Probation officers, certainly in San Diego, but also statewide, necessarily, I believe, have to employ the elements of case management in partnership with our justice system partners and our community partners. And by those elements of case management, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about assessment, assessing the individual, looking into their background, trying to determine how they got to where they are, using the assessment information to plan it's another element of case management, assessment planning, developing a case plan that targets, I'll use this word, criminogenic needs. Five years ago, I was speaking in, bunch, in front of a bunch of judges, and I used the term criminogenic needs, and they looked at me like they didn't know what I was talking about. So I try to stay away from that word generally now. But what it means is drivers of crime, drivers of the criminal behavior. What are the things that led to those individuals committing the acts that put them into the criminal justice system in the first place? So assessment, finding out the background of, of what have been the criminogenic needs, the issues that have taken to, more, to where they are, planning, developing a case plan to target those needs Monitoring, as another element of case management, monitoring is the element that probation officers do anyway, community supervision, and it's what most people associate or when they identify 
with us is just the community supervision piece. But the last element of case management that probation officers, community corrections professionals really need to employ now under the umbrella of realignment, but just in their roles generally, is advocacy. Advocating on behalf of the individuals that they're working with. I went to a case management training a few years ago and somebody said that to me and they talked about probation officers need to be advocates for the individuals that they supervise. And that struck me as odd because historically, or not historically, but for a recent past, probation officers aren't taught to be advocates for anybody. Their, their effectiveness was measured by how well they trailed, nailed, and jailed, how many people they revoked, and things like that. But again, understanding what true evidence-based practices for community corrections is talking about. It is talking about addressing those drivers of the criminogenic needs, those things that have led to criminal behavior, putting together an effective case plan, working in partnership with community providers, with mental, mental health professionals and substance abuse providers, so that we can put together a plan and work together in a way that changes an individual's behavior. So, so that's what we're about. Again, that's an opportunity presented with public safety realignment um, and those that really understand the true opportunity with community corrections. I appreciate, again, what Judge Manley said, that that community supervision really should be there in the community, and it should be where the offenders are. Um, I want to give you a couple of very specific examples of an application of some of these, these principles that we're doing in San Diego. Then I'll close with just another little personal story um, that kind of drives a passion that I feel for you know, the work that I'm doing right now. In San Diego, um, recognizing that with a um, realignment population, you know, individuals leaving prison, post-release community supervision offenders, again, it's not a new population. Prior to AB 109, they were just called parolees. Now they're shifted to the, to the county level. We gave them a new title, post-release community supervision offenders. But those of us in the criminal justice system, and I suspect many of you in the behavioral health care system, may recognize that a critical period for somebody reentering our society is the first 48 hours when they leave prison. Understand that many of these folks have been in prison 10, 15 years. Not all of them, but many of them. Many of them are just coming back. The first 48 hours is a critical piece. What happens in our CDCR right now is these individuals, they get $200 of what's called gate money. Did you know that? They get $200 of gate money, and then they're told to show up at some point in a county within the next 72 hours. Otherwise, they are automatically in violation of their terms of supervision. So. That's a very vulnerable time for untreated drug addicts. Who, untreated drug addicts who, and believe me, prison is not a sterile environment. It is not a drug-free environment. So in response to that challenge, what we've done in San Diego is we've created what's called a community transition center, where probation department partners with our behavioral health colleagues, um, a substance abuse specialist, a mental health specialist, and certainly, again, my probation officers, and we take them through a battery of assessments. They go through a mental health screen, they go through a substance abuse screen, they go through a criminogenic risk needs assessment, they leave the community transition center with a preliminary case plan that's handed off to my probation officers to execute and implement during the terms of their supervision. But a key for our community transition center is we actually go and get them. We don't allow them to just use and rely those the, the $200 gate money and show up in San Diego within 72 hours of release. We go and get them. And we bring them to the Community Transition Center where we also have provided about anywhere from between 40 and 60 temporary beds so that at least they have a place to stay when they're coming back to prison. And on top of going to get them, many of them through that initial screening, mental health and be behavioral health screening are assessing as needing residential treatment. We take them to the treatment programs. So they don't have to find their way there. And we also are dropping many of them off at intensive outpatient programs. But the, the, the point of that was to try and respond to the vulnerability of those first 48 hours when they're leaving prison. We also do a drug test when we get them. And remember, I told you, we're pick, picking them up directly from prison. So we do a drug test just to see who's in need of intoxication, I mean detox curve is a 16% test positive directly from prison. 
And they test positive for um, cocaine, heroin, and THC. I mean, some marijuana. So, and then we give, are able to do a little detox. Another thing that we're doing that is an also an application of um, the collaborative justice principles you know, that I'm a strong advocate of um, is we've started a, um, for the, the mandatory supervision offenders, which is also called the non-non-nons, non-violent, non-serious, non-high risk sex offenders, the local um, inmates, they're serving their prison time locally, who get a split sentence that means they're serving part of their prison time in jail, then they're finishing it under mandatory supervision. We have launched a mandatory supervision plan, which includes a mandatory supervision court under the Honorable Judge Desiree Bruce Lyle. And what happens here is we're actually applying some of the recommendations from the task force that you heard Judge Loftus talk about before. About 30 days prior to these individuals, their release from jail to come back into the community, they're responsible for appearing in front of Judge Bruce Lyle and she goes over their release plan because they will have received services while they're in jail and she holds them accountable for having attended specific programs and, how, and asks them how well they're done. And then they're handed off to my officers in a step down level of supervision. I know I'm running out of time so I'll wrap this up really quickly. But when they, our mandatory supervision offenders appear in front of the court, she holds them account to their reentry plan and then hands them off to probation officers. They're fitted with a GPS device. And if you are familiar with drug courts and collaborative courts, you know that it is a phased system that as they make behavioral changes and achieve outcomes, they're given greater freedoms. This works in the opposite. Very tight supervision upon immediately being released from jail. We um, put them on a GPS device. They earn their way down to an intensive level of supervision until they fulfill the obligations of their case plan, and ultimately, hope, hopefully, successfully complete their prison term. We implemented that um, mandatory supervision court in January of 2013, and in 12-month period, we saw a 12% increase in the recidivism rate of those offenders. And that's a significant increase. That means, and we measure recidivism of these offenders by a new conviction during the term of supervision. 12 months after that program went into effect, we saw a 12% drop in the recidivism rate. I'll, I'll wrap up now with just telling you what you should expect and what I would and charge you with challenging your probation departments, your probation entities, what you should expect from them. Probation officers that are working with these populations right now should have some knowledge of what addiction is and what addiction is not. They should, not, they should avoid treating all of the people on their caseload with one broad swath. They're all the same. They should have a little bit of knowledge of what addiction is. They should also know a little bit about psychopharmacology. They should know how methamphetamine impacts the brain and how it's different from THC. They should also know minimally what mental illness is. Because I'll tell you that unless probation officers have received any level of training, they don't know what that means. They don't know the different types of... Um, behaviors that are associated with different mental illness, and they will respond to them all as contempt of PO. We don't want to respond to them as contempt of probation officer and respond in one like manner. They also should have some sense, I am a believer in decrementing stages of change. Every individual goes through a stage of change. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance. If you talk to a San Diego County probation officer, and I want you to do this, ask them what percentage of their caseload is in pre-contemplation, what percentage is in maintenance, what percentage is in action. Because I talk with my probation officers, I expect them to know that. Because I want them to respond accordingly in concert with a case plan and a substance abuse professional that they might be working with or a mental health professional that they might be working with so that their response to the misbehavior which they will see is appropriate to a case plan and consistent with facilitating behavior change for those individuals. I think that's what should have happened with the individual that Mr. Cook talked to us about. The individual who was um, trying in a quandary trying to figure out exactly what, what decision she should make. It should not be that just because an individual is under supervision may actually commit a violation of those terms of supervision that the automatic response is revocation. And that's not what we're seeing now. The probation chiefs, the leaders that are my colleagues 
among the probation chiefs of association. We're learning this message and we're trying to teach that to our probation officers. So that's what I want you to do. That's what I want you as mental health professionals. One, you should have that relationship. You should have a relationship with the community supervision entity. And you should challenge them. What I tell my officers and what I'll say to you is that our relationship should be seamless. Should be seamless with the common individuals that we're working with. The wider that gap, the worse the outcomes. The closer we work together, the more effective we can be in changing lives and fulfilling our collective obligations. Thank you. Thank you, that was an amazing panel. While they were all talking, I was having this fantasy. Can you imagine having this team in your county? Wouldn't that be incredible?